Welcome to the Bug Hunters Cafe. Hi, Martha. Thanks. Hey, Boyan. Hi, Jason. Before you can ask why you can't park here, it's because of a unicorn. He has a cold. Did the wall color just change? Case in point. I hope that doesn't mess with the portals. Naomi Cedar is joining us today. Naomi Cedar? The former Python Software Foundation Chair. I love her talk about community at EuroPython 2020. That's her. She's been learning, teaching, and writing about and using Python since about 2001. These days, she speaks internationally about the Python community, inclusion, and diversity. She's also the lead of a team of Python developers at Dick Blake Art Materials. That's a lot. Programming, community, art. And ancient languages. She has a PhD in classics. That's an interesting wallpaper. Yeah, I wish we could keep it. Hi, Naomi. We're over here. Get up the chair before it disappears. Hi. Yeah, well, thanks. Glad to be here. Um, that's cool. I take it the unicorn has a cold again? Yeah. Uh, yeah, how did you unfortunately. Know? <laughs> that wallpaper gave it away. Uh... <laughs> okay, but don't mention it to Unicorn. I He's know, trying he's to sensitive. look strong for us. Yeah. Yeah, I should get him some, some tea or something. Did did I just hear a train, Naomi? Oh yeah, yeah. I mean uh, that that's the way that's the way I usually get here. It's it's really convenient for me. I just go downtown to the train uh, train station and then um you know, most people don't know this. You just need to look for the display showing the departures. That's a Windows blue screen at death. That's the train here. Oh, that makes sense. I should I should try that one of these days. I usually just arrive via coat closet, but uh, coat closet, the only way to travel. Ah, there you go. But if, of course, if you don't have one of those, that that uh, that that works, too. And it's and it's better than having to run headlong into a brick wall. I would say. Yes. Uh, I once tried using Jason a closet for traveling. I ended up in Arnia. Never again. It's not a very reliable way. Um, so can I uh, get you anything, Naomi? Uh, coffee's on Soft Terrific. They're the ones who sponsor these talks. Oh, i got to go with my usual mocha latte. All right, I'll grab that. And Boyan, you want your usual? Yes. Right, Cappuccino without any coffee. Absolutely. Naomi, it's a great pleasure to have you here. Ah. And now, before Jason comes here, because he absolutely forbids me for talking about books, I have a bunch of questions for you. Okay. What's your sec uh, second favorite book? My second favorite book? Ah, that's, that's, that's an interesting one to ask, I guess. Um... I I need to think of what I have been my my favorite book and I suppose my second favorite book is always the one that I've just finished or or, or pretty much nearly the one I've just finished. Uh, so um, I I I did finish a little while ago um, uh, another uh, because I read a lot of Isabel Allende. I, I just finished uh, the um, Largo Petalo del Mar, The Long Petal of the Sea, which is about uh, exiles from the Spanish Civil War in Chile. Uh, and it's, it's kind of an interesting historical thing that's set over, uh, oh, geez, over 40, 50 years. Uh, and it's kind, kind of an interesting, interesting one to read. Uh, so, so I guess I'll say that one right now. Uh, if you ask me in a week, it'll be a different one. But uh, yeah. Oh, that's what I love about you. Always a good book to recommend. Here's your uh, here's your coffee, uh, Naomi. And Thank you. Yours, Boyan. Thank you. So let me guess, you're asking about books again. <laughs> I did not. <laughs> <laughs> His secret's safe with me. Nudge, nudge. Um... <laughs> I can smell a book lister a mile away. That's all right. I take notes. <laughs> okay, Naomi. I'm just going to ask you straight uh, here. Are you a hacker? I, 
that's that's a good question, I suppose. Um, I mean, the dead giveaway is how I'm going to answer. I'm going to start by saying, well, that depends upon what you mean by hacker. If you mean what all of those people popularly think that it's somebody that goes around destroying systems, then no. Uh, so you already know then my answer is, but if you think of it as being someone who likes to understand how things work and, and then modify them and make them do different things, then yes, that that is definitely me. Uh, we always used to say that you didn't own a device unless you could take it apart and make it do something different. And uh, in fact, I, I don't do that much these days, but um, in the past I, I I had one of the first generation TiVo VCRs and I took it apart, and upgraded the hard drive and made it run a local server so I could log into it and, and do various things. And oh uh, yeah, lot, lot, lots of little things like that. So I suppose I would have to plead guilty as charged, yes. <laughs> the dead giveaway to a hacker is they immediately start by defining what a hacker is. Absolutely, that's what I was saying. You, you know before I got halfway through that, that the, what the answer really was. Absolutely. I really like how you phrase that. Uh, it's not breaking the things, but it's using things in a way it's not intended. Mm -hmm. And and I suppose, I suppose that might offend somebody. I don't know. I, I'm usually flattered if anything I come up with is good enough that it can be used in more ways than what I thought of. But Well, I, I think that's, I think it's easy to lose touch with the fact that that's such an integral part of our, you know, our entire industry is, is, is hacking because we're always finding novel solutions to things. Um, I mean, rear, rear Admiral Grace Hopper certainly qualified as a hacker because, oh, yeah. um, you know, no, nobody even thought that, um, that, you know, running, you know, a programming, compiling a programming language was something that was, that was, you know, feasible in, in terms of computing and all the experts are going on, oh, no, 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 that's not how this works. And mm -hmm. so she's like, fine, I'll, I'll show you how this works. <laughs> well, and I think, um, I, I suppose this is kind of letting some of my, my humanities background show, but if you look at the way that ideas and 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 things like that in general evolve through the course of, of you know human development, whatever you want to call it, um, we really don't. What should I say our, our thinking about what's original and what isn't is kind of a little bit um, incomplete, incorrect, whatever you want to say. That is uh, pretty much everything that's created builds upon what was there before uh, and then tries to take it and, and put those pieces together in some sort of slightly different way. So that's, that's whether or not you're going back to the first pyramids or you're talking about uh, you know, something new in, in technology. It's pretty much always kind of the same sort of approach. Um, actually, it's interesting. Um, let, let me drag in some more ancient stuff. Um, the very first stone pyramid, I, I, like, to, I like to drag this in, uh, was, was the Pyramid of Djoser. Uh, they just found a bunch of new ruins around there in Saqqara, Egypt. In fact, they've been, they've been digging up some new stuff. It's pretty cool. But uh, the very first one uh, that, that we know, according to the inscriptions, was created by his, his scribe Imhotep. Uh, was was faced in stone, but the stone was carved to make it look like mud brick. Point being, we always take a new technology and the first thing we do is try to make it look like an old technology. <laughs> then we start actually doing new and interesting things with it, which is why, for example, our icon for saving is a floppy disk now. A floppy disk. Right. <laughs> and things like that. So yeah, it's, 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 we're, we're funny beasts, humans. I, I, I saw someone talk about online that, uh, you know, he uh, brought a floppy disk into work because he, I, I think it was because he needed to say something off a piece of legacy hardware or whatever. And so he, he brings his floppy disk into work and some, some, some new kid there goes, oh, oh, that's so cool. You, you 3D printed the save <laughs> icon. <laughs> Exactly. It's like I was, I was just I was looking at that icon the other day and thinking I love the fact that my grandchildren will have no idea what this is. 
And like, even if you go on, on some chat programs, the way to close the chat shows an old phone receiver. I mean, yeah. I don't even have one of those in my house anymore. <laughs> I do, but that tells you a lot about me right away. <laughs> there you go. I've got that right next to my typewriter and my my, my Windows ninety eight uh, laptop with floppy disks. I mean, that's there you go. I I I I, I don't upgrade quickly. <laughs> <laughs> I for years I for years actually carried a Palm Tungsten D instead of a smartphone. Like recent history, I was carrying a Palm Pilot. Uh, they were they were cool, but yeah, for me that would be like fifteen years. <laughs> Well, I mean, I mean, the thing is, what what a palm tungsten could do that a smartphone couldn't is, I could take out that little pen and I could write. I'm not good at typing on phones. All right, that's true. And, but I can, I could write, and and that was that was amazing. Like nothing's come close to, to Palm's graffiti feature. And frankly, I wish someone would write software that would imitate that. But of course, you can't use a stylus with a smartphone, so it, you know, right. well, you can yeah. if you find one. But where do you put it? Yeah, yeah. You know? No, it's true. That was very well thought out. Um, yeah, uh, there are a couple of uh, I don't know ebook readers or not taking uh, uh, with uh, e-paper that allows you to write it, but hmm. it costs more than ten years of supply of paper. Well, well yeah, true. yeah, and it doesn't fit in your pocket. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. You know that was, but yeah, yeah. You mentioned the you mentioned the hacking thing. It's like I hacked my Linux to. I mean, it wasn't like really advanced stuff, but I was like rounding up old software and shimming things in and writing bash scripts to allow me to sync my tungsten to mm-hmm. my, my Ubuntu 18.4. That's how recently I was I was playing with 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 this. Actually, I only just deleted the alias out of out of my out of my bash my uh, bash RC because I the tungsten finally died. Yeah, it's, there you it's go. Like, it's like all those mm-hmm. years. It's like, oh well. Man, I like to on. tell people that uh, Jason is always ready for time travel. Yeah, I, I, su- I suppose so. I, th- I am. I am. All, I always have been a bit of an anachronism. So, so Naomi, how did you first wind up getting started with with Python? You've obviously been using it uh, since um, pretty early on in the language's lifespan. Yeah, um, I uh, I can actually. Uh, I, I can tell you pretty much down to the day. Uh, I believe it was August 27th, 2001. Uh, and I know that because I was at Linux World in uh, San Francisco. And um, I was technology director at a private school at the time. And our, uh, our headmaster was notoriously cheap with, with professional development money. Uh, and he wouldn't let us stay for the whole thing. He only let us go for the tutorials because that was the only thing that was useful. Uh, so, uh, the, the tutorials that I went to that, that day were, uh, a, a day long thing, part one, part two, morning and afternoon by, by this guy, Guido Van Rossum that, uh, had this language Python that was getting some buzz and people were saying it was kind of cool and so i thought well yeah i'll i'll go in and 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 sit for that and so that that was the turning point as they say uh where i i decided that python was pretty darn cool um i've been doing up to that time i'd been doing a lot of programming in c c plus plus and well, and Visual Basic and Delphi and all of those things that we did in the late 90s trying to make software. Um, so, and I was teaching. We, we had to, we had a requirement in, our, in the high school that uh, everybody had to take a class that included programming before they graduated. Uh, and we were, had been using uh, Turbo Pascal for years uh, another classic, uh, and um, it was looking like the thing we were going to be pushed into using next was Java, and I really did not want to teach a room full of ninth graders Java. Uh, so the discovery, the discovery of Python was was pretty dramatic. I rewrote our our intro curriculum as you know, like our intro to programming unit, which took several weeks. You know, uh, I rewrote it on the plane home. 
Uh, and uh, we were teaching Python to kids a month or two later. I mean, that was that's the luxury of being in a private school and being the head of the computer science department at a private school. We made that change really fast without committees oh, wow. or anything. We just did it. So yeah, that was the start. And then I, I rewrote a, I wrote a student management system in, in, uh, in Zope, uh, another, another classic of that era. Uh, it took me an entire summer to understand Zope enough to get something to work. Uh, Zope was really impenetrable. For those of you who don't know, Zope was... Um, the big web, yes, uh, uh, the big web platform written in Python in the in the early two thousands. Uh, Guido worked for Zope Corp for a while, uh, and 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 some of the core team worked for them. Uh, and it had this uh, object database, and it had all sorts of innovations. But it the one thing it didn't have much of at the time was documentation. So you kind of had to read the source code to figure out what was going on. It was a big, complicated program. Uh, I mean, you used templating, databases. It was darn cool. But also, as I say, it took me like an entire three months of beating my head against it to get something to work. But Zope was a monument to cleverness. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. But the, the thing ran for, ah, I think nearly 15 years. I had left the school four or five years earlier before they finally retired that application. So it was, wow. it was a success, but yeah. That's that, that is, that is cool. And, and to be able to learn Python from we though is, is my, my, my introduction into the language was, was not quite as dramatic. I was coming from visual basic and I hopped into the IRC room for Python, which I still hang out in. And uh, I was, um, you know, coming from a typed language, and you you probably know this feeling, Naomi. Coming from a typed language, the first thing that 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 jumps out at you and confuses the living daylights out of you is dynamic typing. And I was not I was not understanding it, and so I I, I was going through the tutorial, and I was not getting this concept because I've I've always had this this don't trust verify kind of kind of thing with programming tutorials. And so I I, I asked in the room, I said, well, how do you declare a data type? And I still remember Hab Nabbit, who's still one of the regulars in them, in the room says, you're a, you're a data type. And then he goes on to explain <laughs> how dynamic typing works. And that turned out to be the best possible introduction into Python, because not only did it help me understand dynamic typing, but it immediately told me what it is I was getting myself into with the community. Because Pythonistas are weird. <laughs> Well, I suppose you could say that, yeah. <laughs> but they're also some of the nicest people you're ever going to meet. You know, once once you, once you learn not to take the snark too seriously, um, you feel pretty safe around them as as as, mm -hmm. as a rule, or at least at least I did. You know, uh, but I, I regularly have to warn people when they first enter the room, and they're like, you know, wondering if they should be, you know insulted that we're not answering how do you do x we're asking why are you doing x i was gonna like, say or, or going on to say you shouldn't do x at all really what you want to do is yeah. y I know. exactly <laughs> exactly right you know and so uh you know how many pro how many python developers does it take to screw in a light bulb you know only one but it takes 20 to figure out the most pythonic way to do it right and, uh, you know, so I, I regularly tell people who enter the room, it's like, welcome to Python. Please mind the furniture on your way down the rabbit hole. Right. You know? There you <laughs> but, go. <laughs> but, you know, once once you get used to having your your the, 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 the fundamental concepts of your design challenged at every turn, it's it's really rewarding because, you know, by the time you're done, not only does the software work, but you know why it works. And it's beautiful. Uh, for me, my origin story, it was basically, I was in a burnout mode, uh, working on some Java project, and then I saw Python, and I said, okay, I'm going to try something in Python just to see how it works, and then I saw that file is open using open file name, and that's it. You don't have to write write a gazillion boilerplate code in Java. So I quit mm -hmm. that job and started doing Python stuff. That was all it took for me. But it oh. took me, I think, two or three months until I stopped writing Java in Python. As you mentioned with the defensive <laughs> That's type. not bad, actually. 
Yeah, it's uh, like, okay, I'm going to let this variable go in and I'm not going to write uh, 15 lines of code just checking the value. I'm going to trust myself. And decorators. Yes. Once I figured out the decorators, I felt so ah, smart. Ah, there you go. Because when you come from Java, like, decorators are the weirdest thing you ever see. Like, you can do that with functions but how <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's objects all the way down i keep telling people that it's objects all the way down um i watched that uh, lecture i believe it was uh pie ladies uh minhen if i'm not mistaken you were yeah. giving a talk about that and it was awesome ah thank you thank you you know i i have i have seen you speak um I remember seeing you speak at, at EuroPython 2020. Actually, I got to introduce your yes, talk, which indeed. was awesome. That was that, that was how we met. But um, I was really impressed with the fact that you could do that entire thing without a slide deck. I mean, that was, and I was seeing on the Twitter, it's like that that went semi-viral afterwards because everyone was posting this. And like most of the talks at the conference, people, you know, one or two people were like, oh, this is really a great, good, good talk. But yours is like everyone kept posting. I cannot believe she did this entire awesome, amazing keynote without a slide deck. <laughs> it was... uh, yeah, it's uh, it's something I like to do from time to time. It doesn't work for everything, of course. You've got code samples, but when you're talking about about um, community and things like that, you know, I'm not sure that people actually need to see uh, the slides. So the thing I liked about the EuroPython one was. Uh, I thought I was very clever for abusing Zoom and, and switching the backgrounds to make them be my slides. Uh, very hacker-esque. Yes, yes, <laughs> indeed, indeed. And uh, I know, I, well, I don't know, but I imagine that, that maybe some of the more conventional types are going, oh my God, what, uh, what if this goes wrong? Uh, but uh, it's, it's not usually worth worrying too much about that. But uh, I, I gather, I think there's actually an experimental Zoom plugin to do that now, to use the, the background. Uh, I as... think it's official now. Is it official? Okay, there you go. There yeah. you go. Cool. So, uh, but um, I, I was, I think when I first started thinking about doing talks without slides was when I saw uh, Peter Hingens do it at, at EuroPython 2014 in Berlin. That was the first EuroPython I'd been to. And uh he, he gave a, a great talk uh, and, and it was about, uh, I guess, the human side of coding and things like that without slides. And I, I then uh, posthumously, some of his friends pulled together his, his essays and things like that, which is, which is another good book I would recommend to you, boy, if you haven't looked at it already. Uh, but uh, he talked about the, the theories behind um, his thinking of doing doing talks without slides and all of that. And it, it makes people pay more attention, honestly. The slides are a huge distraction. Mm. And besides, it's different. It wakes people up. So yeah, that's, uh, that's why I do it from time to time. Uh, can you just repeat the name of the book? I, it's, I, I would need to, I'll need to look it up for you. I don't remember. Um, I, it's uh, Peter Hinchens, which I think is H-I-N-T-J-E-N-S. My apologies if that's not right, but I think that's what it is. Uh, but um, there is a, uh, a a collection of his his essays and writings that was published. He he had cancer and and died. I think it was twenty fifteen or something like that. So, uh, but he was he was an interesting guy uh, and, and certainly a very good speaker. And with, particularly without uh, without slides. Yeah, Peter Peter Hitchens, H I T C H E N S. No, that's the journalist. That's the journalist. Yeah, I was just going to say that's not right. No, that's not him. Well, Jason, if you find it, send it on Telegram. Yeah, abso abso absolutely. Or if, if, if you find it, um, Naomi definitely mm -hmm. send it over. I definitely <laughs> we'll will. We'll have to put it down in the notes, too. Uh, yeah, I was gonna say actually, your uh, your slideless talk gave me the courage to kind of do something similar. So I wound up speaking of pajamas, and I started putting together my, my my slide deck. And about two slides in, I went, "Why am I doing this? I don't want a slide deck." So <laughs> I deleted my slide deck, 
And I did the entire thing in Visual Studio Code. I used Markdown files for ah, cool. my, um, for my, um, you know, like where, where I actually needed bullet points, as it were. Uh, and I did the rest of it live coding. And um, that that was that was a lot of fun. It, it, I guess one of the reasons it keeps people awake, because everyone's like, is it going to work? Is it actually yes, going to run? I, you know, it's a, it's a little bit of a little bit of adrenaline rush. It's like a scary movie for programmers. And uh, it's, you know, I... I find it interesting, too, that a lot of people say, well, you know, I hope, you know, I, I hope the talk goes well. I hope everything works. I hope I don't have any bugs. I hope, it's like, you know what? Don't don't worry about it, because if if you make a mistake, if you have a bug or whatever, um, that is a great opportunity to then show the audience, hey, here's how you fix this. You know, mm-hmm. even though you didn't plan on it, it's like you're sitting there. Like, I wonder why this is happening. Oh, I forgot to put this thing here. I, I, I promise you, if you do live coding and screw up, all of those people checking their email in the back are suddenly going to be paying attention. Just like <laughs> attention level will go way up. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, I think actually it might not even be such a bad idea to kind of deliberately screw up from time to time. You'll have more people involved. Um, yeah. So, and they're not going to judge you. They're really no, not going to judge no, you because everybody makes going, mistakes. Yeah, they're all sitting there going. I don't have the courage. I ain't getting up there. <laughs> well, also inspired uh, by this talk, retroactively, uh, two weeks ago, I gave a talk at uh, Python Ireland, and I did it without the slides. Ah, bravo. And it was scary, but it was also incredibly amazing because I never got uh, that much engagement from audience, especially on the Zoom Uh I mm-hmm. got so many questions and people uh, started discussing. It was a m- lot more uh, collaborative than just giving a talk. And I never had that effect before. So I take it you're going to yeah. do that again then, probably. I don't know. It was very scary. But <laughs> it was a- well, <laughs> with, with practice, it all gets less scary. So Yeah. And... and- and as my and as my my, my beloved college uh, speech teacher Lewis Watkins, who I, hopefully he's listening, I've been talking to him lately. Hi, Lewis. Um, as he as he would as he would tell us, you know, the all speakers get butterflies in the stomach before a talk, every single one. But the great ones teach their butterflies to fly in formation. There you go. There you go. That's probably I, I a love good that way of picture. putting it. Yeah. Well, and, and two, I think ditching the slide deck is also good because we tend to read the slides, which don't ever, don't ever read your slides. Yeah, I see that's, that, that's that rookie that's mistake. bad. Especially when they put every single word that they're going to say on the slide. And so there's like paragraphs and they're reading it out loud. It's like, this could have been an article. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, well, and actually I went, I went one further. Um, I gave a talk at, 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 at my local user group, um, couple of weeks ago and it was a last minute thing because i was like oh there's a user user group meeting tonight oh they need speakers and so i submitted i submitted a talk that i came up with on the spot i submitted the talk two hours before so i did not have any notes mm-hmm. and nothing i just walked in with 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 my vs code i'm like you know what i'm gonna i'm just gonna present what i've been working on with this packaging thing you know with packaging python and flat pack i'm just gonna do that mm-hmm. and i did it was amazing because they, they they all really liked it but i had no, normally i like to have a script i like to have an outline i like to have a plan i like to rehearse i had nothing i was just like you know what i'm just gonna show them how i did this and um everyone really appreciated it oh and, yeah um, you know, ad, ad living a talk every. You know, obviously, don't do that for a conference of you I know mean, ten thousand people. Yeah, but <laughs> choose choose your opportunities. I would say, yeah, but people, uh, people really appreciate vulnerability. Uh, when you show them, you are also human. Like I'm not better than you. I'm just yeah. like you. I'm gonna make mistakes, and uh, please have a patience with me. I'm gonna have patience with you as well. Mm-hmm. That's uh, basically showing them. We are all the same. We're all in this right. together instead of watching them from a platform and just preaching to them. In, in a way, vulnerability is a superpower. People don't appreciate that. But uh, because so many people are afraid to show that they have any any weakness, then, yeah, it's, it's a very, a very, very powerful thing. Hi, Bug Hunters Cafe. 
Marta speaking. Absolutely, we're open 24/7 at Buckhunters.cafe. You can also find us on Twitter, Dev, and Instagram as Buckhunters.cafe. The wall color. Um, that's literally the first time someone asked us about that. Yes, I imagine an irrational fear of orange would be a challenge. The walls are normally a light blue flower print. But unfortunately, today I can't make any promises. We are undergoing, shall we say, spontaneous randomized interior decoration. Yes, ma'am. We hope to have our decor stabilized by tomorrow. Perhaps check with us then. You're welcome. Goodbye. Huh. Those purple striped curtains are nice. Maybe I should start some soup. So, Naomi, um, that talk you gave was, was one of the things you were talking about is, is community. Um, the, the programming community, which you've been a involved a lot in in helping build so if one wanted to if, if one were involved in a community or a group and was looking at it and thinking you know we sure seem to be rather homogenous around here it's like there's not it doesn't seem like people who are new or who are in any way not like us are coming how can how could such a person improve that improve that situation most effectively to make their space safer for different people of different experience levels and different backgrounds well you know there there are a couple of things a couple of things involved there i mean i think one of them is that uh, the people who are saying that are, are are doing it from a place of goodwill but they themselves probably don't have very diverse networks themselves. And I, I think that it's something that I know I've, I've tried to do. And, and I think everyone can continue to try to do that is to try to uh, find ways to, to make contact with groups of people that are different and expand your personal network. Uh, I think more important or as important though, of course, is just having, um, having that that outreach and and that sort of system be you know be done on the part of the the community that you're trying to make more diverse um, code of codes of conduct are really important as long as they're actually enforced um because that's that's one way of of assuring people that they're going to be safe um i know there are there are sometimes people who think a code of conduct is uh like either a restriction or an insult. It's like, of course, we're all wonderful people here. Why would we even need a code of conduct? It's insulting that you suggest we need it. But of course, it's not for the people who are there and feel safe. That's not who the code of conduct is, is really for. The code of conduct for the people who aren't there and, and don't feel safe or don't know that it's a safe place. So um, I certainly know that when I was, was transitioning in the Python community, that where codes of conduct were pretty new, but that was something that was very important to me is to know that um, uh, there was a commitment from the community that I would be safe. And if, if a community can't be bothered to even do that, why should I take any risk to go and join them? Mm. You know, and I, I think we, we lose sight of this. The people that are that we're asking in are going to going to make a contribution by their showing up. They're going, they're certainly, you know, taking risks and, and actually expending effort is not without cost for them. And their diversity will make the community better. So when when you actually are inviting somebody like that into your community, you're not it's not that you're doing them a huge favor. If they actually join you and become part of your community in a way, they've done you the favor. Mm. So, you know, it's um, it's a case where I think it's important for the people that are doing that to be aware that if they want to bring different people into their community, they may have to change a few things to make it 
welcoming for those people. If, you know, you've had a bunch of people who have been doing the same thing forever and nobody different ever wants to join and they keep on doing things exactly the same way, it doesn't matter if they put on their website, we welcome everyone, you're not going to get different people unless you actually make some changes, do some things to show that you actually care about people. Sure. Well, and I, I think there's some there's something to be said for, I, I, don't, I think most people don't think they're jerks. Most jerks don't think they're jerks. Absolutely. It's like, and, and all of us have the propensity. It's not like I'm singling anybody out here. Everybody has the propensity to be a jerk in some fashion to mm -hmm. somebody, you know, and, and, you know, we all need, we all need some level of accountability humans don't function very well without accountability you know structure that accountability how you will but we don't do very well when we can just do whatever we want <laughs> sadly that that is all too true yeah uh i i think that's that's probably a good point i think something that you kind of touch upon also goes along with with the ideas of of you know privilege which gets people upset as a word sometimes in that um there are certain people who, because of who and what they are, have a little bit easier time of things. And of course, you know, it's like uh, straight white males in, 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 you know, U.S. and Northern Europe and whatever. They certainly have some advantages that, that other people don't have. But everybody, everybody has some axis of privilege compared to other people one way or another. Uh, yeah. so, you know, no, nobody, I, I think what you need to do there is avoid what we sometimes call the oppression Olympics. Uh, everybody, <laughs> everybody has some room to grow here. Uh, but you know, it's, it's nothing personally against you if you acknowledge that, oh, you know, I, I, I have these advantages. So I understand that actually it's not as hard as it is for this other person who, who, doesn't have those advantages. I, I think that I, I wish that weren't such a, a political hot button. Yeah. Well, and, and I think it's important to remember too, that um, we need to focus on our own narratives and our own behavior rather than everybody. It's so easy right. to look at other people and blame them. Absolutely. You know, we like having a them that we can blame and go, well, yeah, you know, they need to understand that they have privilege. It's like, no, 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 no. This is not about their privilege or the fact that they could phrase their needs better, or the fact that they could behave differently. This is about you, mm -hmm. You're, you as an individual. What are your privileges? How can you express your boundaries and your needs better? How can you better participate in this? Well, it's, and it's it's like, um, you know, we were talking with um, Amber Vandenberg and, and Le, um, Leis um, Carvalho mm -hmm. and, um, uh, about this a bit, and... Um, you know, it came up that, you know, I will never try to critique the um, way that people of color express what they're going through, even if I think maybe it wasn't put the best, because I don't have that shared cultural experience. Right. I don't really have a place to critique them. But even if even if there's areas where where, you know, they could improve their messaging, that's up to them to figure out. And there are people in any community who are going to help improve the messaging. But my job is to help improve the messaging in my community. Right. And if I focus on that instead of on them, it, 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 I certainly am less of a jerk and I'm considerably less angry, too, <laughs> as a result. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, uh... When I reflect upon my old self, I can tell confidently that I was a jerk lots of times. And I don't think I'm a jerk right now, but I know in two years I'm going to look back at uh, myself and see how many mistakes I made. <laughs> I kind of wish yes. uh, I had that uh, hindsight. Because it's usually with those kind of faults, they're in your blind spots. You don't mm -hmm. know you're making that mistake. Absolutely. Yeah. It, it would know, for the most part, you know, the villains of history never realize they're villains. They think they're heroes. You know, it's 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 not, and it's not that they're just delusional. It's that that's kind of the human cognitive bias. It is. Is that we often don't realize, 
and it's and so you know it's so easy for us to obsess about you know where we feel like we're facing injustice and i you know i guess on the topic of diversity too it's it's one of the reasons why you aren't going to hear me complaining about you know some people like to complain about affirmative action it's like well you know you know people a person of color in some situations or a woman in some situations is going to have an easier time getting a job in some companies than than, than a man will and you know we could debate well, whether or not that's that's there or not but just assuming for a moment it is uh if i look at just how many advantages i've had mm-hmm. as an as an ostensibly white male uh-huh. because most people don't see the fact i'm mohawk indian but um you know the white part of my heritage has given me privileges and so until i've had to put in as much work as say your average um uh black female to getting a coding job i'm not going to say one word of complaint because i have had so many advantages until i've had to put in a lot more work than anybody in any other group i don't really have grounds to complain you know so so yeah. so so maybe something's a little quote unquote unfair well i've i've benefited from unfairness too so i mean it, it, it evens out it, it reminds me of of something that that ruth bader ginsburg may she rest in power uh said she was asked uh how many women she thought would be enough to have on the supreme court and she said nine and <laughs> they said well but but that can't be fair. That that would be all women. Uh, and she answered more or less to the effect, well, yeah, but think about for how many years it was just nine men. Uh, so, yeah, it's the same thing. Exactly. It's, it's you know, and, and of course, the thing is, is that um, Ruth, um, you know, Ruth Bader Ginsburg was not saying, of course, by saying that, that, well, you know, men have no value in society and should just go drop dead. Right. But that, you know inequality um has been such a thing for such a long time that even if things were to the exact opposite extreme for 200 years right exactly uh it 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 still would not qualify as unfair so you know i i I, and that's 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 the hard thing i think for a lot of people in tech to to wrap their heads around i mean remember all the acrimony regarding switching from 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 master to main as the default branch on on GitHub, and it's like you know what? It's how hard is that? It's two commands. I have two 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 yeah. Git aliases that that handle this for me, and it's it's such a minor thing. But if it makes a few people feel safer, it's not going to hurt me right. in the slightest. Yeah, I mean that that actually was there was quite a thread on that in Python Dev mailing list, as I recall. Um, <laughs> yeah, that was uh, it was a big deal. So. Switching switching gears completely here, what is the weirdest bug you've ever encountered, or at least one of the weirdest you've ever encountered? Um, you know, there 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 are lots of things. I mean, I think um, I think that a lot of the bugs that we run across are bugs in communication and specification and things like that. Uh, mm. My my favorite one, and I, I've I've told this story various times to people, is. Um, a few years ago, I, in fact, when I left the education world and switched to, to being more in the business world, I was working for uh, a, a startup subsidiary of a big Fortune 100 company. And um, we were revolutionary in that uh, we were doing everything strictly online, no sales, no discounts, whatever. It was just a low price online. Cool. Uh, I mean, this was only 2011. It took this particular sector to realize this might be a thing. Uh, but so, so, so we were doing that. And that meant that we had to send orders to the, the company's legacy mainframe and from our online system and everything. And that was that was fine, except that that system was really slow and it tended to time out when we sent orders. So we would have to like wait, you know, and it, it's, it's sort of the way that you do these things. You can wait like two minutes, four minutes, 10 minutes, et cetera. You know, you have this kind of uh, logarithmic scale for how long you wait to see if you can actually get a response back and things like that. Uh, so we did that because we were assured that... Um, we would be fine because if you sent the same order twice, 
uh, which was a possibility. It could be that the system actually had gotten the order and was processing it and timed out before we got the answer. That as long as you didn't send the same order twice in 24 hours, you were fine. So we did that, and then we started getting duplicate orders going through the system, which is kind of a big deal because, you know, if you send somebody two $5,000 pumps, they don't always send the second one back when you call them and ask them nicely. <laughs> uh, it's like, hey, you said it. Uh, so, you know, what was going on? And we finally ended up wading through all of this debugging, and there was nothing wrong with it system and we involved the people from the other side and they kept insisting that everything was working perfectly on their end and then we finally found out that no it wasn't that if the same order came through in 24 hours it would be rejected as a duplicate it was if the same order came through twice in the same calendar day and in fact all of our duplicates had been submitted after 11 p.m and we hadn't been able to actually get our acknowledgement through until we'd sent it after midnight. So that's where all the duplicates were coming from. So, oh, wow. and it was, it was, it was, everybody was insisting they were, their systems were working. Everybody was of goodwill. We were all trying our best and we weren't understanding what we were saying. So <laughs> those, those things are the, are the craziest, the hardest to, to deal with, I think. If you get a syntax error, or even if you have some weird edge case in your code, usually, eventually, you control the situation enough that you get it to do the thing, and you can make it do the thing, uh, and then you can fix it. But communication bugs, they're hard. Well, and that kind of goes back to something that we've been kind of come to the conclusion of when we started this podcast we were thinking Bojan and I were thinking oh okay we're, we're, we're going to talk about you know uh, compiler errors and we're going to talk about you know seg faults and we're going to talk about you know how, how to how to use a debugger more effectively and that is not what this turned into at all this is what what it turned out is exactly what you said that most bugs are just basically most bugs are people mm -hmm. fueled and it's it's I, lo I loved how I loved how I think it was Vitahi Joshi put it when she said that um that most bugs are um just oh gosh how did you put that is like they're they're they're, they're 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 basically they're failures to communicate they're they're misunderstandings of mm -hmm. what is needed um i'm probably i'm honestly butchering the quote and i feel terrible for that because she certainly deserves to be quoted but um yeah most most bugs seem to be driven by um, miscommunications. Yeah, well, and I mean, now my, my team has been the past couple of years implementing um, a, a pricing scheme. Uh, and our biggest problem is that we used to do in our company, they used to do all of their pricing by people looking at the competitors and saying, oh, this looks about right. And we've automated that fairly successfully. But the biggest headache was, oh, we always do this thing. So we would do this thing. And then we would test it. They go, oh, no, that's wrong. We never do that thing here. Uh, and so getting people to actually specify and describe the problem space correctly is another <laughs> real challenge. As a uh, owner of the company, uh, every time I get a request uh, for proposal from a client with a very vague uh, specification, which is always... And they ask me how much uh, time is going to take for this and how much it's going to cost. Mm -hmm. I have no idea. <laughs> I mean, I can talk a uh, week with you about what you thought about this, 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 and this. Like, if you tell me notification system, what does that mean? Right. <laughs> yeah. It's like that, that's the moment when you ask them, it's like, okay, you have two options. I can either lie through my teeth. Right. Or you can just accept that I have no earthly idea <laughs> well and this is what all all of the things that we have done to sort of fix development methodology one of the motivators and i suppose this is why we've never actually achieved it because people don't don't always acknowledge this is the motivator the motivator is to tell the person paying for it how much it's going to cost and None of them, not, you know, certainly not Waterfall, but not Scrum, not Kanban, none of those. We haven't been able to actually achieve that to the, to the satisfaction of anybody. You can't, you still can't tell them 
at the beginning of the year how much you're going to spend on this project and when it's going to be done because we don't know what the project is um, no <laughs> too too much too much well i it's i wrote an article a few years ago called gallifrey and software project management and, and i address this this whole concept of what i call flux and that all those unknowns that basically the key to project management in software is to embrace the idea that there's a lot of things you don't know and to label it and so i label it flux and i try to get you know a, a an experienced project manager will often be able to look at it and, you know, in, in, in concert with their, with their developers, be able to look at it and go, okay, well, I can identify there's flux here, 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 here. You can usually count the spots of potential flux and you may miss one or two, but you'll be in the ballpark. Mm -hmm. But then the difficult thing is understanding that, that, that flux, it's like a bridge with an unknown length. It could be two feet, absolutely. two miles, or two light years long. And you have absolutely no clue. And so the whole key to project management is minimizing that flux and making sure that, you know, your client knows that, okay, you want all of these things, but understand there's unknowns here, 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 here. So we need to limit this flux. So let's pare this down so we only have one or two unknowns. Right. Because mm -hmm. then we can give you an estimate and, and land somewhere in the conceivable zip code of the estimate. Right. right but if right. there's all this, if there's 30 areas of flux, then then my estimate is anywhere between $1,000 and all the money in the world. There, and I, There you go. Somewhere in there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <sighs> MP card. <laughs> I did one, exactly one. No, I've done more than one. I don't know why I'm saying that. Let me take that back. I've done a few websites for people back before I got out of web development. Because I'm not a fan of web development, but it's something I could do earlier in my career. And uh, I, I did some websites. I still remember this one that I did for this one client. And she agreed on a design. I was actually working with a graphics designer for this one. And she, she agreed on a design. We had even sent her, like, sketches of the design, you know, what the website was going to look like. And sent it to her. She approved it. She signed off on it. We start building her website. And when it's almost done, we show her the preview. We say it's not finished, but you can take a look and see, you know, is this, you know, uh, if there are any minor adjustments. And she's like, oh, actually, I want to do something completely different. And she comes up with this completely new design. And... I, I, of course, I have never been accused of being a diplomat. <laughs> no one could ever accuse me of being a diplomat. I'm a lot of things, but I'm not that. My my version of diplomacy, I'm, I'm Irish and Mohawk. Diplomacy does not run in my veins. Mm -hmm. My flavor of diplomacy is send somebody else so I don't scalp you. That is how diplomacy works with me. And anyway, so she's like, well, could you do, could you do all these, uh, th this g completely over? I'm like, well, we, we could. She said, and could you keep the price the same? I said, no. That's not how this works. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. If you would like us to do the website over, we'll do the website over. But you will have to pay from the beginning. Because we already put in all this work. Right. <laughs> you know, we're, we're not just starting over because you're literally wanting us to start over. You're going to pay from the beginning as well after paying us for this one. She decided that her, her design changes were not that high a priority. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's usually the case, yeah. <laughs> As long as it's not their money. <laughs> but, oh man! But that 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 that. Uh, but you, you know, you, Jason, that you, website would look so good on your CV. <laughs> <laughs> well, if it if it were still online today, it would. But, um. So Naomi, if somebody wanted to get into tech, but felt like they were a part of the, not a part of the, 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 I guess, click as it were, how would they go about starting this journey? Well, so there we've got the question. Uh, so I, I, it's, it's a good question. Um, I think that for one thing, um, probably somebody who feels that way isn't as much of an outsider as they might think. Uh, that is, there probably are groups that they could be part of. Um, 
for for women, for example. I mean, it's certainly there's pie ladies, there's rails girls. There, Go has various things. If they want, if they want to learn things like that, there are probably uh, places that they can go. I mean, you know, internet searches, they can probably find meetups or groups or things like that. Um, so, so that that may be something to consider. Um, they can. You know, I, I think in general, groups that have welcoming communities will, will bring in people and bring them along. That's maybe a little scary, but uh, I think sort of looking a little bit more actively and maybe even it's possible to, to, to look around and find other people who are interested. Um, in general, um, I think that... Um, something maybe we don't consider but I, I think there are a lot of a lot of different different groups that maybe feel they're not part of the mainstream and maybe they feel there's nobody else from their group that's interested usually that's not true all sorts of people actually want to get into our business because they can see that it's it's interesting it's fun it's it's a possibility of, of maybe uh, you know being able to earn a good living there are all of these things that they can do so yeah, I, I think it's more being a little bit more active. I think that, you know, just sitting there waiting for that community to find you. Yeah, that may not work, but uh, searching and talking to people. Um, it may take a while. Uh, years ago, I was contacted by somebody in Nigeria who said, there is no Python community in Nigeria. I code Python and this is horrible. Uh, and I said, well, you know, you'll need to start one. And he's like, oh, I don't know. But eventually somebody did take that up and, and, and started one. We connected the people that were interested and now, you know, they've had their third or fourth PyCon now. They, they've got a booming community. So, you know, don't take no for an answer one way or another, I guess. You know, I, that also puts me in mind. I, I've read some interesting conversations online lately where some people are saying, um, you know, you don't have to know math to get into programming, you know, and they're just saying, you know, saying you need to know math is just gatekeeping. And I can, I can, I think I can understand some of where they're coming from with that, but I think it's a little bit misleading. I don't, you know, I'd be interested in your opinion on this, Naomi, but I think there's a, I think there's a lot of, I don't think it's, it's so much math in the traditional sense that we think of it like math class. You know, most people don't mm -hmm. really hate math. They hate math class, but I, I think, I think to do well in programming, no matter what you're going to do, you do have to be good at, at what I like to call numeric reasoning. Like you may not need to know right. this particular branch of math, but you need to be comfortable with mucking about with numbers. I, in some I think that's, that's probably true. Um, I mean, sometimes they, they use the word numeracy for that or, or whatever. Yeah. I think it's really important to, to have some basics at least in terms of being able to do, um, I think really to be able to do uh, back of the envelope estimating is the thing I always come back to. Uh, I'm enough of an old timer that in high school physics, I used a slide rule. And to use a slide rule, of course, you need to, you need to be able to estimate things because slide rules don't give you decimal points. They'll tell you three, but you don't know if that's three to the power of, of uh, you know, three times 10 to the power of 100 or three times 10 to the power of a negative 100. It's your job to know where you're at. Uh, and I think in general, if you're coding, you need to have that same sense just to keep from shooting yourself in the foot. You do a test answer and you get back 3.72896. And is that really? you know should your answer really be around four or should it really be around 40 you know you, you need to be able to do that kind of estimating to to be able to catch yourself and i think just in general to be able to think maybe think a little bit symbolically as well um you know I, uh, algebra and geometry i i think are both very useful uh, for day-to-day -day coding websites data crunching, all sorts of jobs need that. Um, calculus, 
not always needed in day-to-day -day programming. When you do, you really do. Uh, but um, at least those basics, I think, yeah. And I don't know, I wonder how much that's addressed in things like boot camps and stuff like that. Because it seems to me that could end up being down the line sort of a weakness if somebody went through, say, a boot camp or some sort of program like that and didn't have that basic numeracy. So I guess I, I hope they do that. I don't know if they do or not, but I hope that they do that. Well, and and I, I think what branches of math you wind up using really depend on, on your Absolutely. subspecialty because it's like if you're working on physics engines, you're, you're doing calculus a lot. Absolutely. I, I, I saw somewhere that there was a, a way of looking at the branches of mathematics that I thought was really interesting. That geometry was the math of space. That algebra was algebra was just structure. So let's get that out of the way. Algebra is structure. Like you, you really cannot get away without algebra in some capacity because you're going to have to find the missing number at some point in your Absolutely. life. Absolutely. End of story. But beyond that, it depends on what you're doing. So geometry is the math of space. Calculus is the math of change. Yeah. How things change over time. So as soon as you're dealing with change over time, including anything relating to like physics engines, um, you're going to mm -hmm. be dealing with calculus. Um, linear algebra comes up a lot in, um, in like, uh, graphics because you're, sure. you know, you're doing a lot of that, but, um, that's just kind of another way of, of, of representing things. I'm not, it's, it's, it's still algebra. It's still part of structure. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, trigonometry is still kind of off of that, off of the geometric of space. You know, you're working with triangles there, which is fun, but, um, statistics is, is drawing conclusions about numbers. If you're going to get mm -hmm. into any capacity in data science, you're going to have so much stats and people are starting to warn on, on social media that, hey, if you want to start messing about with, with machine learning or data science in any capacity, get good with the stats. Because if you don't have stats going into this, you are going to be very, very lost. Absolutely. It's going to be very confusing. So I, I feel like we're almost kind of doing a disservice by saying you don't need math. It's like, no, you might not need calculus right now, and you may be able to put off linear algebra for another three years, and you may never need statistics because you're doing this thing over here. But just be, like you said, the numeracy. Be be willing to learn it when the need arises. Yeah. Yes, no, you exactly. don't need to solve, you don't need to do matrix multiplication on paper, but mm -hmm. <laughs> you should at least know what's going on. One time in my job opportunity arise uh, when where i had to use a taylor series and that was magic to everybody else that brought some huge uh, speed ups to program basically i took exponential function and replaced it with uh, taylor series you know everybody was how does this function why is it working and why is it so fast <laughs> Yeah, you want to look like a wizard, no math. <laughs> there, there you go. So, yeah, and, and, and again, just remember, I used to be a math tutor back in college, and just remember that most people don't hate math. They just hate math class. You know, math in the real yeah, world is enough. a lot more rewarding, and it's a lot less confusing than math in the classroom. And it's fun. One of the most fun classes I had is uh, optimizational methods, and it was a bunch of linear programming. And it was so beautiful because for every method, professor told us a story where that method was used. And he gave us an anecdote. Basically, okay, so Russians at the beginning of the 20th century used this to figure out the minimal uh, uh, square footage of uh, tin foil to create uh, the can that has the maximum uh, capacity. <laughs> and he explains how there they did go. it. <laughs> and to this day, I know that uh, for cylinder height, uh, optimal. Uh, how do you call that? Surface mm -hmm. is uh, when uh, your radius is half the height. <laughs> All right, great. I'll keep that in mind. <laughs> I guess it's just that classic thing that we, d you know, we don't really have grounds to, to learn something as developers, as, as, as a rule. We, we don't kind of, we can't, we have a hard time coming up with emotional grounds to learn something until we, we can see where mm -hmm. it's used. It's like, sure, I could go out and learn um, uh, Delphi if I wanted to, but 
it's not going to do me any good in anything right now. No. Um, it's not, it's not going to help me. And Kubernetes, the same thing, you know, every job is asking for Kubernetes and I wish they would stop because it's like, I can learn Kubernetes when I need Kubernetes. I have never had a project that needed it. Right, right. No, I mean, that's that's what um, Kathy Sierra used to call uh, just-in-time learning versus just-in-case learning. So we do a lot of just-in-case learning. You're going to memorize the whole book. Just in case you need that thing on page 542. Uh, versus you're going to learn this because we're doing this now. Uh, and, you know, it's based on motivation just in time learning learning it when you need it when you care about it works about a thousand times better now if we can just teach hiring managers that i know i know oh no i once failed the interview with the client uh, because i didn't know what uh, solid was uh, short of and i asked the person oh. okay <laughs> What is it short of? And they knew for the first three letters and they didn't know for the rest of them. And I told them, okay, I know all those uh, principles I'm using them. And then I discussed with them intricacies and stuff about that. Mm -hmm. uh, we had some interesting discussion because, uh, okay, class should have only one function was their definition. I said, no, class should have multiple functions and stuff like that. Class is based around the data. Mm -hmm. They should be have single uh, responsibility, but it doesn't mean they have a single function. If you're working with uh, uh -huh. that, you need to use functional, not object programming. And I didn't get uh, that uh, job because I got the explanation. They actually were very nice to answer me. They said, uh, because I didn't uh, know the solid principles, uh, they could not hire me because they value very hard uh, engineering uh, knowledge. I'll, I'll, I'll see that in Reju Aliskov substitution principle. So there. <laughs> Thank <yeah>. you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh. I need explanation on that. Substitution, uh, Liskov substitution principle. Oh, that's 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 one of the principles of object-oriented design and inheritance. Uh, and I'll, I'm I'm gonna mess it up, and people will 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 be, be pointing fingers. So I don't know if I want to go specific. Everybody there. messes it up, Naomi. Everybody I, I, that's, messes that, it that's, up. That's 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 my that's my feeling. That's my feeling. I think I Robert did. Martin messed it up according to Barbara Liskov. So there, don't feel there bad. you go. I I did, <laughs> I did see at a PyCon <laughs> Poland years ago. I saw somebody actually give a talk on the Liskov substitution principle that made sense, and that was that was striking because <laughs> it's sort of. <laughs> I, I think the fact is most of us don't know what solid is in practice. It's like we can we can theorize it about uh, about it all day, right, but in, in in practice we can't really write solid code. And maybe that's not such a bad thing because I have seen solid code that was absolutely the worst code I've ever seen in my life. Was a Python project. It's a well known uh, CRM, and it is written in python but everything is inherited from everything else and it is perfectly solid and is completely impenetrable literally go. hundreds and hundreds of classes and they all inherit from one another all the way up the chain to a so b inherits from a and c from b and mm -hmm. d and e from c and they even call composition inheritance like they overload a python composition to also be inheritance because of course composition you know who uses yes, that yes 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 and then they make a change up here in the higher level mm -hmm. classes, you know, and they don't document the change and it breaks the entire ecosystem in one fell swoop. And then they ship it as a minor release <laughs> and they don't include go. a proper change log. And then everybody has to scramble to completely rewrite not only all the libraries and all the plugins and all the extensions, but also all the uh, books and tutorials that cover this CRM. And I spent one month working in this, and I finally said, "No, I'm I'm done. This is the worst code I've ever seen in my life." Sounds Part like a fire. lot of job security there, if you ask me. <laughs> yeah. Well, Naomi, this has been an absolute pleasure as always. Oh uh, yes, I, I enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you for asking me around. Thank you for being here. You were an absolute pleasure. Oh, thank you. Thank you again. And I like that new wallpaper. I wish I wish we could keep that wallpaper, but the unicorn will probably sneeze again. It yeah. won't. It'll get better. 
Don't be like yeah. that. Someday. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna go uh, check on him. He needs yeah. love. <sighs> well, thank you so much. Thanks again. Bug Hunters Cafe. This is Marta. Yes, we are located online at bughunters.cafe and on Twitter, Dev and Instagram as Bug Hunters Cafe. We have a table for five, sure. <laughs> or we did. I'm sure it will be back shortly. Oh, the music is provided by audionautics.com. We have a link on our website. You're welcome. See you soon. Sir, you might not want to put your coffee on that occasional table. It's more occasional than normal today. Okay, no. I draw the line at popcorn ceilings. Drink your soup. <laughs>